everybody for joining that webinar, uh, Japan program webinar at SRS uh, on uh, the new world concepts and the future of the Indo-Pacific. And it is in a very specific context. Of course, there is a COVID-19 that uh, everybody is following extremely closely, including in terms of strategic consequences for many countries. But it is also uh, timely for a few reasons that I just will very quickly mention here. First, uh, Foreign Minister Motegi of Japan did for the first part, uh, first time, sorry, take part in January uh, to a video conference between European Union foreign ministers in January to discuss cooperation in reali realizing a free and open Indo-Pacific involving EU and Japan and of course other countries. So this is a very important point. It was the first time. Then, as I mentioned to my colleagues earlier, yesterday the French Minister of Armed Forces tweeted about a French nuclear submarine and export, export sorry, long mission in the Indo-Pacific, including in the South China Sea, to defend, I quote, international law at sea and demonstrate freedom of passage. This is also a very important on the importance of the concept on concrete, uh, concrete manifestation and realization behind it. Uh, we have also, of course, a new administration in the US but also recently reasserted the significance and the, of the free and open Indo-Pacific concept and among interrogations concerning the role of Quad and the concept of inclusion, India is a major actor in the region that contributes uh, very much to the security and stability of the area. So, um, we have two excellent speakers uh, who are also my friends uh, to, to make to present uh, to, to make uh, each of them will make a presentation for about 15 minutes it will be followed by a q a uh, mr nobukatsu kanehara is one of the main strategic uh, voice in japan and among his highest level position he became uh, in 2013 the inaugural deputy secretary general of the national security secretariat and he also served as Deputy Director of the Cabinet Intelligence and Research Office under Prime Minister Abe. And he is the author of many books on Japan's grand strategy. And he is currently a professor at Doshisha University. And uh, this gives him also the opportunity to write many articles on Japan's foreign strategy, on, in particular, the Indo-Pacific. Uh, Mr. Kanihara well, was one of the uh, people who were at the origin of that concept in Japan. Dr. Uh, Monica Chonsoya is a senior fellow among many activities, a senior fellow at the Japan Institute of International Affairs in Tokyo. And previously, uh, she spent some time at Hokkaido University as a researcher and as associate director of studies at the Fondation Maison des Sciences de l'Homme in Paris. And she specializes in contemporary Asia security, weapons uh, proliferation issues, nuclear strategy, great power politics and strategy in the Indo-Pacific. And she has written many books on Asia security affairs, uh, centering including on China, Japan and the Senkaku Islands, conflict in the East China Sea, among, um, among uh, American shadows. Sorry for the difficulties. So, I will not take more time and we will begin with uh, Professor Kanehara followed by uh, Dr. Chon Soya. And please, if you have questions, use on, at the bottom of your screen, uh, do use a Q on air button to, uh, but, yeah, button to, uh, to, to write your questions that I will moderate and relay after the presentation by both of speakers. Please, uh, Kanya, uh, Kanihara san, the mic is yours now. Thank you very much for having me. Valerie. Um, I'll make three points today. One is the liberal international order is now standing up in Asia and we need European help. This is one. Two, challenges China, Chinese rise, because they don't embrace the same version of liberalism, same version of history, and we have to somehow engage China. 
The third point is the strategy, how to engage China. That's a huge nation now. And we need the cooperation among the West, and we have to do that with the young democracies in Asia. I, I'm going to make these three points. One is the liberal international order is now standing up in Asia. We have to defend that, and this is precious for the many Asians. The liberal thinking is the human dignity is absolutely equal, regardless of skin color, religion, ethnic traditions. It doesn't matter. It is very important for everybody. Every human being is born to be happy. And the government is only the instrument for that. And this is now shared by everybody. This is the beauty of 21st century, that this was not shared very easily. Last century, we lost the lives of tens of millions, wars, revolutions, dictatorship. We had it. And the precursors of industrial revolutions, the Europeans and Japanese, somehow Russians, and the G7 nations plus Russia were precursors. They tried to realize the liberal order, the parliamentarism, judicial independence, and these things. But Asians were under colonial rule. They were discriminated. And the dignity was trumped in the 21st, 20th century, in the, in the first lap of the 20th century. They came up one by one, in 1986, the Philippines turned to democracy in Asia. And one year later, Korea turned to democracy. And one by one, ASEAN nations turned to democracy. Taiwan democratized itself under Lee Dong Hui. And this happened only 30 years ago. And we have to encourage this trend. There are many difficulties then, extrajudicial killing in the Philippines, the shaky kingdom in Thailand, and Myanmar is now doing a coup again. But we have to help them. They're very proud of young democracies. And the biggest challenge is, of course, China. And China does not share the same liberalism with us. And they struggle to pull down the Qing dynasty. That's Manchu's dynasty. And then hence now took power again. But they failed to make a, a liberal society inside. They don't share the same principle with us. And by 2028, the China can be bigger in terms of economy than the United States. Amazing, isn't it? Native Germany was 30% of US. Japan, Imperial Japan was 10% of US industrial power. Now China is surpassing American power. It's coming in 10 years time, it's real. But I have to say, if Japan is combined with US and Europe is combined with US, India combined with US, we are far bigger than China. China is now 16% of world GDP today. US, 24%. Europe, 20%. With Brexit, it's a bit smaller. <laughs> Japan is now 7%. India is already half of Japan. Amazing, isn't it? It's a big, big, big economy today. And the Korea is one quarter. And Australia, Indonesia coming up. The West is far bigger than China. When we are united, we could engage China. When we are in this RA, we have to surrender one by one to Chinese pressure. And this is the reality of the world politics. And we can be united. Mr. Trump took a very hard stance against China. His problem was his alliance management was not so good. With us, it's very good. Abessa was very close to Mr. Trump. We had no difficulties. But the Europeans had a very difficult time with Mr. Trump. Now we have to ask Mr. Biden to realign and rally around the United States, the all the Western nations to sustain this liberal international order, not only in Europe, in the, in the, in the United States, but also the, in Asia, liberal order is standing up. We have to sustain that, that's our responsibility. The how to do this, this is the strategy part. It's not easy. It's not easy, but anyway, we can all agree that the liberal order is precious to everybody. For many agents too, we have to, we have to sustain that. We, have, we can agree that very easily. Even Vietnamese, the ex-communist nations, they are trying to change. And they can't cherish the plural democracy as we do today. But they are engaged in economic reform. We have to push them forward. And the free trade is very important. And there are many market distorting practice by China. We have to push it back. And finally, we have to keep strategic balance with China. These three things are very important. Value part, I don't, I don't think there are many difficulties on that. We can agree that we have to. We have to be careful to 
the, to face the young democracies. They have flaws, as I said. The Filipinos are accused of killing the drug dealers in an extrajudicial way. Thai is shaky, King is in difficulties, Myanmar had a coup. But the imposed sanctions in this way and punishing them, uh, it's sometimes not very productive because they see us that they, we are talking to China. Uyghur, Tibet, they do many bad things, but we're talking to them because we need them for climate change, for money investments. We cannot play double standard. We have to accuse them of doing bad things, but we have to listen to them. And sometimes we have to help them to go for democracy. Punishing is good for domestic politics of our society, but does not help their democratization. We have to help them. The liberal, liberal um, the free trade part, this is very important. Now in every advanced nations, manufacturing industry is flowing out of the border. It's going to China, going to ASEAN nations, going to India now, and the people are angry. Not labor union people, the conservative liberals are very angry. That's Trumpians. They're putting back the government towards the domestic politics. It's very strong in the United States. Somehow we feel that in, in Japan and in Europe too. We are domestic politics oriented, but we have to change that. Japan is the only nation who made the mega free, free trade agreements, the Japan EU EPA and TPP, sorry, Americans left this. And now RCEP, we are still there because with the Australians, New Zealanders, simply because we believe that without us, it's Chinese kingdom. So we, we, we are there. We saw that India is there. India left this RCEP, but when I try to pull back ours to RCEP in India, we have to pull back the Americans to TPP. It's not easy, but that's our final goal. And the strategic balance part is not very easy. The FOIP is a big idea, the values and free trade and prosperity and strategic stability. Strategic stability, um, very frankly, the medium-sized nations are, are, are not very much forthcoming simply because their neutrality orientation is through there. Don't involve me. Don't involve me. When we say, please come together with us, they don't, they don't sit in front of us. They sit in, in the back seats and they say, say that, say that. Somebody should face these difficulties and meet big ones responsibility and we have to say japan has no we are, we are a bit like germany but we don't have nuclear french we don't have nuclear british around us it's we are alone here and korea is a very big nation now 10 percent of i'm sorry 25 percent of japanese gnp and 600,000 modern army one of the biggest in asia and second great armed exporter in Asia. We have to engage Korea, but with the leftist government, it's not very easy. Then Australia is a very trustworthy friend for us, but they are only in the Southern hemisphere. So we have to rely upon, we have, the Americans are four alliances, Japan, Korea, and Philippines, and Thailand and Australia. We can count on Australia today. That Japan, Australia to face China, sorry, but we can't do that alone. Americans are far away. We are talking to India. India is non-alignment, of course, but Indian population will surpass China very soon. And Indian population's average age is now 30 years old. Amazing, isn't it? Japan is 50 years old. <laughs> we are 50, very old. China, Americans, they are roughly uh, 40 years old in average. So in 10 years' time, China will, China will pick out, and then it's India's age. So we count upon India. India is a born democracy, and we have to say that the to defeat Tojo and Hitler, Americans shook hands of Stalin. To defeat Stalin, Americans embraced Mao. <laughs> and now we have to engage the born democracy in India, the creation of Gandhi and Nehru. We alienated them by embracing Chinese, but we have to put back India in the place. This is the core concept of in the Pacific in terms of strategic balance. We have to do it. Then we can maybe face Chinese and we can ask China and engage China so that they will not go to derail themselves like Imperial Japan in 1930s. China has difficulties. One, 2008, after the Iman shock, they got overconfidence. The Americans are done, Europeans are done, Japanese are dead. Now this is Chinese age. It's too early to say that. 
We are far bigger still. We want to engage them. So this is overconfidence. Second is uh, Denzel Pin's education of the of the kids, because then conceded the pure ideology of communism. He just abandoned it. He embraced it. Foreign investments. He needed something else to face the jingoistic communist leftists, and he just took it. He just just presented the legend of foundation of modern China by Communist Party. This is patriotism. That's ingrained in the kids' minds. They tend to overemphasize 150 years humiliation by the Westerners. And now it's very, very, uh, they're very emotional. And it's very dangerous, I have to say. It's combined with nationalism soaring up. It's a bit emotional, dangerous phase for Chinese. Third is Xi. Xi's generation is the this is the cultural revolution kids generation. They destroyed universities and professors for 10 years. And they don't know what the Western world is. I believe that Kim Jong-un understands what the Western world is because he was in Switzerland for a long time. This generation was cut off from the Western world and they spent their youth in that confined space of language. And that generation has no earning for it freedom so we have to overcome this difficult fate with china but when we are united we can do it thank you very much thank you thank you professor uh, kanehara for this uh, okay. extremely uh, deep uh, presentation of what is behind the concept of indo-pacific that goes far behind uh, strictly uh, security in military terms for instance even though this is extremely important and as you mentioned the question is for middle powers what to do i mean what alliance we can build uh, what partnership who to integrate in the concept uh, i mean focusing on the concept and this is also very important for the EU where as you know France has its own defense of the Indo-Pacific uh, strategy recently published in English for those who want to know about it and uh, but also you have Germany and the Netherlands but maybe behind, behind all these Indo-Pacific strategy of different member states and even more so for the next Indo-Pacific uh, strategy of the EU there are many questions about what you put in that big bag of Indo-Pacific and this is something that we definitely have to discuss with India and with Japan. So now I will uh, give the mic to uh, Dr. Monica Chansoya. Um, thank you, Valerie, for having me. Uh, it's always great to have a conversation with you either uh, via webinars or otherwise. Um, I think um, the subject that you chose today uh, couldn't be better, couldn't be more apt. Um, there are, you know, whenever we are discussing the newer elements and concepts in the future of the Indo-Pacific uh, in 2021 particularly, I find that there are elements of both uh, change and continuity that have to be taken into account. Um, I'll begin by briefly discussing the elements of change that we are witnessing in the future of this Indo-Pacific. Um, the end of the Cold War opened a newer facets of security given the nature of the discourse, which expanded in ways that pushed frameworks beyond state and military security. The beginning of the 1990s marked a systemic shift in the study and analyses of security and the world order to crucially encompass non-traditional security in the traditional security frameworks. It is in this reference that the 2020-21 COVID pandemic continues still to witness how profound a non-traditional security issue in the name of a pandemic can be to human survival and well-being of peoples and states. As Kanehara San mentioned earlier, the COVID-19 uh, has already resulted in the death of 2.3 million people globally, as per the latest figures. The pandemic has destabilized global economies with poverty and hunger levels reaching unprecedented, unprecedented uh, disturbing uh, proportions, thereby highlighting that its social economic impact has been far more devastating than the pandemic itself. 2021, perhaps for the first time, is seeing a non-traditional security issue racing past the traditional facets of security per se in terms of policy approaches and the requirement to search for global solutions. 
2021, we are likely to see the issues of climate change and human epidemics taking center stage at global discussions. The past year has underscored that the referent of security is no longer just the state in terms of state sovereignty or territorial integrity, but also the people and their survival, their well-being and dignity, both at the individual and societal levels. The ongoing non-traditional security issue has challenged the very survival of people and states in it being transnational in nature and scope, defying unilateral remedies and requiring comprehensive political, economic and social responses. This brings me to mention the just concluded 2021 Davos Agenda Summit of Global Leaders. While addressing the summit, French President Macron focused on tackling inequality and climate change were manifest in the larger ambit of linkages to the pandemic. The crises have been a far more deeper moral one in addition to being purely economic. In the race between shareholders and consumers, today we see it is the planet that is paying the price, taking into account the social, environmental, and democratic impact. In the same reference, hours after being inaugurated as the President of the United States, Joe Biden's decision to re-enter the US and the Paris Agreement was another key pointer to the centrality of climate change in the global discussions from this year on. The climate change agenda will have an impact on Asia's regional agenda with climate equities likely to be a key constituent of discussions in the Biden administration's approach in the National Security Council, even on security issues, I'd argue. And this brings me to briefly touch upon the 2021 Copenhagen Democracy Summit, which is being scheduled in May this year, uh, dedicated to strengthening the resolve of the world's democracies by providing a high-level strategic forum exclusively focused on the cause of democracy. This summit will be a vital defining event of this year, given its commitment to democracy and open debate in a symbiotic way. The Copenhagen Summit is likely to discuss the future of global democracy, of US leadership in this entire setting, post-COVID recoveries, and of course, most importantly, of democratic trust among uh, countries that share similar values. Therefore, I, I guess it would be suffice to state that the agendas of global health, climate change, democracy, liberal ideas, rule of law, are going to be the highlights of 2021 and are visibly being taken up at par with the traditional security challenges that can continue to confront the Indo-Pacific, which actually brings me to the second part of my talk on the elements of continuity of Indo-Pacific's future and the region's continuing and mounting political security challenges. In the security and foreign policy making realm, the COVID-19 pandemic has triggered an overalling of the security agenda in many countries and regions. The, ge the geostrategic and military maneuvers undertaken by China during the summer of 2020, while the pandemic was at its peak and the world was grappling with it, showcases Beijing's endless pursuit of revising the existential status quo on multiple fronts. This applies to all of Beijing's existential territorial disputes from the East China Sea to the South China Sea to the Himalayan borderlands. All these regions have experienced a visible disturbance of the pre-existing statuses and efforts to shift the power balance. COVID-19, for that matter, has undeniably reshaped the geostrategic landscape across the Indo-Pacific with dramatic consequences. Many vital economies are engaging in conspicuously uh, decoupling from uh, China in key economic sectors. For that matter, there has been noticeable international pushback against China with a concurrence on devising strategies to boost economic resurrection and development while strengthening the strategic environment across the Indo-Pacific region. Asian partner nations and multilateral maritime constructs need to engage in collaborative endeavors aiding in securing the stated global commons. Asia's contemporary political strategic reality is seeing an apparent conflictual binary between Washington and Beijing, while the Biden administration's Indo-Pacific approach 
uh, might just see some minor alterations in terms of nomenclature per se or not. The core strategic objectives, including the role of key actors and regional allies seemingly is remaining, is continuing, and is going to be further built upon. The first half of 2021 definitely shall clarify the strategic track adopted by the Biden administration for the region. This brings to highlighting the need and the importance of the continuity of the Quad's relevance in the Indo-Pacific's strategic construct and Washington's decision to build upon and carry forward the four-nation Quad comprising the United States, India, Japan, and Australia, as has very recently been acknowledged by the US National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. Moreover, in the recently declassified uh, American strategic framework for the Indo-Pacific, the Trump White House's Asia strategy apparently came across as one that was focused on maintaining America's strategic primacy in the Indo-Pacific, prioritizing ARC denial military strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, Within the first island chain, the, de the declassified document proposed strengthening the capabilities of key U.S. allies in the region in that it would contribute to the end state of the overall regional Indo-Pacific strategy at large. Regionally, ASEAN unity and centrality will remain at the heart of the Indo-Pacific concept. However, ASEAN centrality does not necessarily have to imply that it is the sole venue for conducting diplomacy alone for the region. Perhaps 2021 might see creation of nodal centers for dialogues all along the sidelines of the ASEAN summit being encouraged. Further, Asia and Africa shall continue to be impacted by the development of connectivity via open, transparent infrastructure that is based on international standards, including transparent debt financing practices, thus contributing to the broader sustainable development of the region. Achievement of the United Nations-led Sustainable Development Goals Initiative is possible, including a major focus on cooperation in the fields of sustainable and clean forms of energy, including nuclear as well as renewables. While the overall defense and foreign policy posture adopted in 2021 by leading Asian democracies shall be a key determining pillar, the strategic uncertainty vis-a-vis -vis China and long-standing territorial disputes remain bitter continuing realities. They also continue to serve as a reminder that a Asian democracies will continue to be pushed and possess capability-based forces to ensure their own survival and to deter the numerous asymmetric challenges designed and employed by China across the Indo-Pacific. The Biden administration is expected to re global leadership by means of increasing presence across the Indo-Pacific, strengthening allies, prioritizing alliances, identifying newer partnerships, as it weaves a comprehensive global strategy amid an interminably long-running long strategic competition with China. The United States has been in a comparative state of hegemonic and global decline, whereas the case of China has been rather contrary. This is the new normal and how China shall take on territorial issues needs to be put on the region's calculus in dealing with the latter's expansionist driven strategic and economic agenda. This has not been a tactical shift for that matter. There are structural gaps and weaknesses in global capitalism that China has been working and observing in terms of its own dialectical materialism construct. History has witnessed that the United States has the latitude at times to stumble when dealing with China, uh, with Asia, pardon me, given the complexities of the region, its demographics, compelling history and the baggage. The opportunity for Biden is to work with allies and partners in the South China Sea to impose diplomatic and economic costs on Beijing. There are significant geostrategic challenges ahead. China's initiative to urge Biden through its state-run media to replace the term Indo-Pacific with Asia-Pacific initially was one among many others. The looming question remains whether Beijing seeks to alter just the mere nomenclature or intends to effectively inject a conceptual and policy-oriented change in the Indo-Pacific. I'd like to conclude by arguing that any version of resetting Washington's ties with Beijing cannot afford the cost of pulling back on the firmness of dealing with unilateral revisionism in Asia particularly if the Biden presidency's Asia policy includes the goal of reviving America's Asian alliances. Any undermining of the unswerving approach on China 
or a slippage of Washington's pledge towards restoring its alliances with Asian allies and partners will prove detrimental, not just for Asia's future, but for the United States' own place in this Asian order. I'd like to conclude with that and hand it back to Valerie. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Monica, for this uh, extreme and uh, interesting, fascinating contribution in a very broad way to the issue asked uh, in uh, that uh, webinar on the significance and future on evolutions, possible evolutions and content of the Indo-Pacific uh, concept. Uh, now I would like to open, uh, I will not say the floor, but the screen to questions from the audience. I see that there are about 56, a little bit more, maybe people watching this, so, but I have no questions. So I'm just asking the people who are taking uh, advantage at watching us at these fascinating uh, contributions by our two speakers to please uh, contribute to it also hours. by asking their own questions. Yes, there is one appearing, but I will let some uh, come and I will maybe uh, come back to the notion of ambiguity uh, around that concept. I ambiguity, I'm sorry my English pronunciation is a little bit special but I'm sure Monica understands me very well so she can translate <laughs> ambiguity. How do you say that in English? Ambiguity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> proper English. Anyway, uh, because I mean if we are very frank, and especially for us working on strategic issues in the Indo-Pacific, one of the major, I mean, the factor uh, that helps everybody to talk about it, think about it, is of course direct interest for France. We all constantly remind uh, that we, we are an in, indeed an Indo-Pacific country with a very huge easy and uh, territories in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Uh, but the, the principal factor is indeed, as was perfectly demonstrated here, China. But at the same time, uh, everybody knows that China is a big problem in the region. So where China has a potentially an effective destabilizing role in many sectors, big, big, big trade, um, territorial issues, you name it, uh, uh, there are issues with, uh, linked, related to China. At the same time, for many countries, both in Asia and in Europe, but also sometimes, maybe less so in India, but Monica, you can come back to it, there is an ambiguity. Some actors really are not eager to uh, confront China directly and would like to be able to keep the idea of doing business with China, keeping China as an opportunity. We saw that in Europe with the signature of CHI and including uh, RECIP in Asia. You mentioned Kanehara San that, uh, uh, of course, this is not only China, there is Japan, Australia, New Zealand, so it's a way to balance China, but still, China could present. <clears throat> show these uh, agreements in Europe and in Asia as a kind of strategic victory, whatever the reality. So there is this ambiguity is how we can deal with China in between realizing the difficulties, the challenges posed by China in Asia, in Europe, for Europe, in Asia, in the Indo-Pacific, but also um, the, for to many, uh, the necessity to protect opportunities, access, economic uh, relations with that uh, huge power uh, that has also uh, huge problems and poses huge problems. So that would be my launching uh, remarks. And maybe if you want to react to it, I will then come back to the questions from the uh, audience. Uh, maybe, uh, Kani Harasan, you can begin, and uh, then uh, Monica Chonsoria, about the ambiguity of what we do with China. The Asia is not structuralized like in Europe. Europe, during the Cold War, you have the Warsaw Pact and NATO and the EU, right? And you, you made a, a new community here. It's a bit in problem today with Brexit, but it's, it's now okay. Asia is very different. The nations were born in 1950s, 1960s. They struggled for quick developments, many experienced dictatorship. They turned to democracy one by one in late 1980s. 
1990s, they became free democratic, but they have still difficulties. And they are still very small. Indonesia is the biggest one. We can't ask them to stand up against China in front of us. We can't do that. They'll never accept that. We need leadership. Leadership should stay with the precursors of industrialization and democracy, the Japan, United States, and we very much hope that Europeans stand by with us. Then we are far bigger than China still. They, they can rally with us. And if we ask them to be a pawn of our chessboard, they'll never accept that. We have to show them one that the, our society, the liberal one, can make happier our people than Chinese dictatorship. Our, our free trade can survive. And third, we can maintain the advantage in the strategic balance in the region with the old Westerners here. And then we can engage ASEAN nations. And this is the meaning of Quad. Quad must be extended to the European nations. And we hope very much that Korea, is, Korea, Korea will be with us one day, <laughs> maybe with the conservative government. But that's what we have to do. Okay, thank you. Monica, do you want to please? Yeah, I, um, I think uh, the, the time for dealing uh, with ambiguity with China uh, has, has entered phase two. I think 2020 and the pandemic uh, has been uh, probably the defining milestone where now countries will have to make a choice um, because China per se for that matter has has uh, indeed come a long way I mean ever since uh, the cultural revolution and the decades post that where the entire modernized the concepts of modernizations were being put in place today you have a China which is politically and strategically uh, not on exactly the same lines as it was back in those decades. Today, we have a China which is increasingly assertive. We have a China which is looking beyond territories. Uh, it is looking to redefine territorial lines. It is looking to redefine history to justify those new territorial lines. So there is a revisionism. Uh, uh, revisionism is, is, is the heart of this entire strategic and foreign policy uh, um, posturing and decision making that is being uh, taking place in Beijing and uh, it is it is the Asian democracies as Kanihara san very aptly mentioned you know I mean they will all have to rally together in order to cohesively discuss and and uh, find concurrent ways in what in which to ensure if nothing else at least the continuing stability of the region we cannot afford uh, the, the the factors be it their economic <coughs> factors whether they are political economic factors whether they are geostrategic factors to completely uh, put the balance, uh, the strategic balance, the security balance of the region uh, uh, in a state of disarray. I mean, the, the democracies, it is, it is incumbent on the democracies to not allow that to happen. And for that, there has, there has to be, as, as he very, again, I'll, uh, I'll refer to what Kanyara san said, it is the quad. And at, an, at a later stage, we have had brilliant uh, trilaterals which are functioning very well with Asian partners and uh, with uh, recently France is also part of one of the trilaterals now and um, I think these these uh, discussions the, the trilaterals the quad an expanded version of the quad at a later stage this is the way to go ahead and uh, the I guess the time for dealing am with ambiguity with China probably has gone past. You really need to take a choice. And as the bottom line is, there has to be imposition of costs uh, at, at uh, disturbance of the region's uh, status quo. That, that, that decision to impose costs has to be taken. That is the central issue here. I quite agree with you, but I will follow on with a question by uh, Didi Kirsten uh, Tatlov, but you, I think you know her very well. <coughs> She's from Berlin. And actually, she is asking that question. Uh, could the panelists please comment on how they view Germany's new Indo-Pacific guidelines and how they see this fit into the overall picture in the Indo-Pacific area? These guidelines don't mention Taiwan, a fact that has been pointed out. And uh, I must say, to add to Didi's uh, question and to follow up on what I asked before, is that you have maybe different vision and more ambiguous 
vision of what is an Indo-Pacific in some countries where you don't want to mention very precisely China. Uh, you know it is there, but you are extremely prudent in mentioning something about China. And other countries, uh, maybe more security-minded, who are less timid about mentioning that uh, issue on security, and security, uh, I mean more security or even military security issues. So if you want to answer, what, how, how do you see uh, Germany's version of the uh, Indo-Pacific guidelines and Indo-Pacific strategy? Uh, maybe uh, Kani Harasan. Yes. Um... When I was in, in the government, I was saying to my colleagues in the foreign ministry, just come, with, come, come to me with the grand engagement policy of Germany. Because mm -hmm. after Brexit, Germany is becoming more and more important in the European politics. And German's economy is huge. And the, we have to engage Germans. But Germany is like Japan defeated in the Second World War. And German is framed in, by NATO. And beyond Afghanistan, uh, strategic scope is quite limited. And China, Germany was heavy inside China after WTO accession by the Chinese, more, maybe more than Japanese in automobiles, for example. Madam Merkel was going to Beijing every year. We complained even after Abe San took power, Madam Merkel did not come to Japan very often. And we said that the German strategy is rather economic strategy, but we're so happy to see that Germans came up with the Indo-Pacific strategy, we're very happy. The German, the strategic perspective, perspective is, now, is now being broadened, and Germans agreed to send the warships to the region. This is amazing, because Germany is acting beyond the NATO theater and helping us and that's very encouraging for us we want to engage germans for economic parts we have a lot to do a lot to do we had the european japanese epa political partnership and the connectivity conference with prime minister abe and this part we can cooperate much much more all boy one way one road versus our say for or european connectivity things it's very different in philosophy we, wish to, we want to push forward the integration by connecting all the ports and the airports, everything, right? China is connecting the mountains and ports, China center and the other countries. They want to engage one by one. This is exactly like a Russian pipeline. The philosophy is different. And we have to make free markets prevail. For that purpose, the European number one economy in Germany is very important. We are so happy that Germans are now on the same boat. Okay. Thank you. Monica? Um, I'm, I'm pretty much uh, um, in concurrence with uh, Kanihara-san's uh, comment. I think uh, probably an omits uh, that um, omission that uh, the document has is, as Didi said about Taiwan not being there. And I think that's one issue that really needs to be, uh, you know, more at the forefront. I mean, people have to be, um, even if not addressing it directly, uh, to discuss the uh, the ongoing uh, tensions across the straits, and uh, uh, because the tension developing around the Taiwan Strait area definitely has an impact on the East China Sea uh, security. It has ramifications. It has a spillover effect on on the South China Sea because in terms of policy making, in terms of the approaches that are being taken i think it definitely impacts so in the long run that probably when we are when we are uh, enlarging the scope of discussions um that issue also has to be taken into account but other than that i'm pretty much in agreement with what kanihara san uh, said on this subject there are many uh, fascinating uh, questions <laughs> piling up now. So <laughs> I, I would like to ask a question from someone who remains, uh, I, I don't have the name, but quite interesting. Uh, do you see a role for G20 uh, in the Indo-Pacific? And uh, I mean, 
you know that inside G20, uh, China is a participant, and um, and uh, China has been rather supportive of the G20 format as a way to undermine the G7, G8, I mean, places where Japan was maybe more influential. And uh, do you see the G20, uh, this larger format, uh, being um, a facilitator of communication and uh, exchange on engagement on the Indo-Pacific? Do you think it is still relevant? Yeah, um, the, Monica, shall I? <laughs> yes, please, let's follow the format. Um, yes, the we follow. President, President, President Trump was punching, punching the nose of Beijing all the time. And with that approach, G20 is meaningless. But Biden is now rallying all the other allies and friends and making agenda, right? It's cooperation with China for climate change. This is G20 could be useful. The Iranian, North Korean non-proliferation issue, P5 could be useful. Talking about Taiwan with the G20 and you know, P5 would not work. There are issues with there are issues where we could, we could cooperate with China, we should cooperate with China, but there are issues that we have to be united among ourselves. Now this is fact of life, we have to swallow it. And G20 and P5 are still useful as far as there are issues for which we can cooperate with China. Okay, okay. Monica? Um, I think uh, G20 continues to remain relevant on, on issue-based uh, discussions, probably, you know, climate change, sustainable development goals, uh, you know, um, not, uh, quite a few facets of non-traditional security. I think for that, definitely it's relevant, but uh, on other accounts, I think we'd have, to, we'd have to sort of, you know, wait for time and wait for uh, probably uh, the situation to sort of develop and then take a call. I have another uh, rather interesting uh, question regarding the stability of Indo-Pacific, but not only Indo-Pacific. Is how do you say uh, how do you see the evolution? Maybe we will begin with uh, Monica because she has been writing a lot on this, which is a non-proliferation of uh, weapons of mass destruction in the region, the role of, of course, North Korea, but also China. And uh, uh, how do you see that uh, evolution, and how will it wait on? Uh, discussions we may have on the relevance of the Indo-Pacific uh, free and open Indo-Pacific concept, particularly when you look at maybe it was not so much on the forefront because of the COVID-19, but you know that there were many uh, um, shady transportations of materials from North Korea. I, I will. I, I, I'm not a specialist, you know, much more than me, but uh, uh, this is also a very important issue. How do you see it? We may, maybe we will begin with uh, Monica on that question. I think Asia's destiny, when it came to uh, weapons of mass destruction, uh, Asia's destiny changed uh, because of the uh, because of the role and the centrality played by China uh, and later on by North Korea in the illicit and illegal uh, proliferation of uh, components, systems uh, relating to nuclear and missile technology, which spread uh, across Asia, especially South Asia. And uh, uh, the nearly uh, four decade old history on this subject uh, sort of has, has defined the nature of uh, the, the security dilemmas, the security challenges, the tensions that have been uh, occurring in the region, uh, especially in terms of uh, uh, the nuclear politics at play. Um, so today uh, we continue to have North Korea, we continue to have the continuing threat of nuclear and missile brinkmanship. In fact, uh, I don't know, but uh, I would uh, probably foresee uh, uh, a spate of missile tests, um, perhaps nuclear testing uh, by the North Koreans, because uh, as, as history has seen, uh, any incoming uh, U.S. administration, um, Kim Jong uh, would like to sort of, you know, engage with, again, a fresh spate of brinkmanship on that count. So be it directly destabilizing the region uh, or uh, indirectly through the illegal proliferation uh, web 
that was built uh, with, with China definitely at the center of it, as history shows, since the decade of the 80s, I think the, 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 the security environment of Asia, South Asia in particular, has, uh, has been made um, irreversible, you know, I mean, it, it, it cannot go back. It, it, is, it is there, it is there to stay, and uh, you have to find ways to sort of continue to maintain the artificial levels of stability if, uh, if that were if something I could say. I will give the floor to uh, Kadeh Al-Assad on the same question, but I would like to just prolong it maybe uh, a little bit. Uh, do you think that we, we, we may face in the coming month uh, an increased risk of red line testing, be it from North Korea, but uh, red line, I mean, uh, countries wanting to test the limits of the new Biden administration on trying to push the lines in order to see uh, what they can do. And of course, I am thinking of the role of China in the Taiwan Strait, what is going on now around uh, the Senkaku Islands. Uh, of course, uh, even the coup in Burma uh, can raise a few questions. I mean, it's very complicated. We don't know exactly who sides with whom and uh, it's not that easy. But uh, still, China was not that uh, interested in uh, the democratization process, even with limits in Burma. Uh, we know that uh, it increased its cooperation with Burma under the Belt and Road in initiative, but still, uh, they do not seem to, seem to be overly distressed by the coup uh, recently uh, happening in, in Burma. So uh, we, we might see countries like North Korea and China testing the limits of the Biden administration uh, um, to see what they can do if they will face a real will to, to resist or if they can go on and push further. What do you think of that, Kanye san yeah, can I start with the non proliferation part? Yes, 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 please. Japan, Korea, and Taiwan are in a death valley of nuclear weapons here. We have mm -hmm. Russians, North, North Koreans, and Chinese. Russia is minimizing their nuclear weapons to use. They don't de deny first use of nuclear weapons because otherwise they cannot defend that vast territory. That's a new that's doctrine of Russia. It's very dangerous. Americans are coping with that by deploying downsized nuclear weapons in their strategic subs. It's very bad, but Americans have to do that. North Korea is now, uh, they, ha they are capable of destroying Tokyo, killing half a half, half, tens of millions of people in, in 20 minutes time. That tiny nation can destroy Tokyo. That's reality today. And the Russian avant-garde, Iskander and Skinjar, that's, that, that can penetrate a very easy American missile defense system in ours. And North Korea is now maybe importing the Iskander technology from Russia. They can penetrate our missile defense system, but they do not make aggressive war against us. China is different. China is expanding, bullying over Senkaku Islands every day, and they might attack Taiwan when they reach the size of the United States in 10 years' time. Now, it's a reality. China, only China can make a major war here in Asia. We are under American umbrella, nuclear umbrella. Korea too, Taiwan is not. Taiwan has no stationing forces of Americans. There is no formal protection by the United States. And if China starts some aggression here, it would be involved physically instantly. And this is reality. And China's, China was not bound by INF Treaty. They have uh, DF-21, even against the ships. They have DF-17 today. That's hypersonic. And nobody can stop it now. And they're expanding their arsenal. And that this is a reality for us today. Non-proliferation is fine, free. We have the Hiroshima Nagasaki. We fully comply with non-proliferation ideal. But the condition is American nuclear assurance is perfect. Is it? Is it? This is the big, big concern for us. So we have to strengthen the American deterrence here in the region. And then we have we can comply with the non proliferation non proliferation obligations, and this is very important simply because we are in the death valley of nuclear weapons, and the Chinese Taiwan war is real. This is Asian situation today. Okay, Myanmar. Um, I have to say that the, Madame Suu Kyi, she was not very astute to, to deal with the military, 
and the military was, uh, it's, they are Tibetan and Mongolian race, like, like Japanese, they're like samurai people, <laughs> they're very brutal. <laughs> and they got angry, and they made people angrier against the, against the military. This is what's going on here. This is domestic internal upheavals. But China was watching this very carefully. Chinese diplomacy is very different from ours. They don't, they don't speak from the big ones. They want to grasp the small ones to paralyze the regional consensus. That's what's happening in Eastern Europe, in, in, in Europe, right? That's what's happening in Brunei, Cambodia, and Laos. Next target must be Myanmar. They were watching it. They have strong influence upon the mountainous ethnic minorities in Myanmar. They can provide with them the money and the guns. And the, the Myanmar can never say, strong no to, they hate Chinese, but they cannot say no to the Chinese. And China was watching the internal situation and they, I think the military would be kicked out by the Westerners and they go for the Chinese. And that's what China wants to see. And so we have to be careful. We have to deny the coup, but we have to take back Myanmar. That's on Myanmar. Okay. Um. I maybe as a uh, just to give you some time to maybe add what you may want to say, but as a last question, may, I have many questions here. We spoke about Indo Pacific and relations between Indo Pacific and the notion of values, mm -hmm. democratic values, and um, shared values, common values between like-minded countries, implying that democracies do share the same interest and same position, including regarding China. And many questions, uh, many uh, participants did ask the questions about the perception of the CHI, the, 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 the investment agreements between uh, China and uh, the EU that has been signed recently. And do you, uh, how do you perceive it? How do you see it? Or maybe you or in India, how is it perceived? Or in Japan, how is it perceived? Uh, is it um, an abandonment of that concept of shared interest and values between democracy vis-a-vis -vis China? So uh, I will just open that question and you can also maybe add a few words of conclusion if you want before we close the session. Uh, maybe, uh, Monica, do you want to start on this? I, I lost, I lost the audio. I lost the audio. Sorry. Well, what do you think of Kai? Kai, the, 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 the China-EU uh, investment agreement that has been uh, criticized. Um, do you think that it goes to simplify my question against the common spirit of uh, or common values, shared values, like-minded countries uh, concept that is also really related to that free and open Indo-Pacific thing? Well, uh, Kai is just one of the very typical exhibition of the challenges which uh, uh, Asia is going to continue to face. You know, I mean, you we will we will have to deal with this kind of a dilemma uh, uh, where there is economic engagement with China. Uh, nations have their own. Um, you know, uh, agendas, they have their own requirements for economic development, they have their own domestic audience to sort of answer to, they need to show economic growth, they need to show investments coming in. And that's where China definitely is a very important uh, um, player. Uh, closer home we saw uh, in South Asia, um, India and Japan uh, were cooperating with uh, Sri Lanka on the East uh, Container Terminal. It was an agreement which was discussed. It uh, began uh, after that there was, uh, you know, uh, because of the domestic political uh, scenario in Sri Lanka, there was, it was put on hold there. After that, because of the discussions, uh, because uh, the Indian uh, Foreign Affairs Minister visited Sri Lanka, there was a green signal to that, which was a very welcome uh, news. But uh, just a few days back, uh, the Sri Lankans have pulled out again. And they have said that uh, they would not be carrying, uh, carrying on with the East uh, ECT terminal project with India and Japan as partners in the project, which has been a major setback. And a few days uh, after announcing the withdrawal, uh, we have uh, Chinese companies which are uh, investing in energy projects in Sri Lanka. And uh, these energy projects are just around 50 kilometers from the Indian territory of the southernmost coastal state of uh, Tamil Nadu. So I think, uh, you know, be it Kai, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of <laughs> brought it down to South Asia, but be it Kai or 
this project in South Asia, the consistent uh, inroads made by China will have to be uh, observed, will have to be uh, carefully studied, and uh, vital alternatives need to be provided by the countries so that, you know, probably there is an option. Otherwise, most of the lesser developing countries always have this argument that, you know, we need, we need investments, we need economic uh, uh, injections into our economy, and, and China is providing us with that. So uh, unless we have alternatives to provide to them, uh, the situation is going to continue the way it is. And actually, this is one of the major actions that uh, Japan could play in the Indo-Pacific. And I am thinking also of Africa. We didn't speak a lot about the importance of Africa. Yes, Monica? I'll just add, I'll just add to what you said. Uh, in fact, this is one of the areas, uh, the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor is one of the major successes of the Indo-Japanese collaboration uh, in this region. India and Japan have uh, collaborated very well in terms of providing quality infrastructure uh, and uh, transparent debt financing policies um, according to the rules of the game. You know, it's extremely transparent, it's good quality, and it's uh, in, in, in terms of the longevity of the projects, you know, the quality of the infrastructure stands and stays so that that these Asia Africa growth corridor model should be, uh, you know, expanded in, in a much, much broader way and in an extensive way. And uh, India and Japan collaboration in that is becoming a major uh, model to study in this region, uh, extending from Asia to Africa. Please, uh, Professor Kanehara, I leave uh, the final words concluding on what you may have to say to you. Uh, we are approaching the end of our uh, webinar, so please, uh, you have the mic uh, to conclude. The, uh, China is not Soviet Union. They are deeply inside us, and they have a great problem with us, so we have to cope with that. The first principle is we do not abandon free trade system. We do not abandon our liberal international order. We have to protect that. For that purpose, for national security reasons, we have, some, we have to have some restrictions upon investment, upon trade, and maybe on human rights too. We cannot accept Chinese, say, uh, platform, say, SNS or a 5G or a, or a deep sea cable or even semiconductors that could spread malware for cyber intelligence for a, even sabotage in the, in the contingency. We can't accept that. Zero risk. And China does not accept our SNS system, GAFA. China does not accept our NTT inside their telecommunication business. China does not accept our semiconductors everywhere. And they are decoupled. They have decoupled us for, to protect themselves, dictatorship. We have to be careful not to invite the malware and risk from Chinese software, such Chinese um, platform, network, and semiconductors. The X world is very different from today's world. Everything is connected by platform, network, and semiconductors. We should have a clean ones. Um, this for, for here, for, for this, we have to be vigilant. And in particular, we, we cannot accept the technology flow for the military purpose, the very advanced ones. There too, we have to be vigilant. But beyond that, that's free trade. We have no reason to stop it. And there, we have to protect our investors. And there, we need rules. To make rules, we have to have an agreement. So this is what some Europeans must be doing, I suppose. So making rules in the private sector, but a different rule for protecting our military interests and security interests. And this is a new world again. China will take hostage our economic interests. They are, they are very good at, do, good at doing that. But that's a risk that's involved in the new world, the new normalcy with China. So investment is, itself is not bad, but there should be some new rules for security and for the protection of our investment. Okay, so thank you very much to both of you, to everyone who came and participated listening to that webinar, asking questions, and uh, see you for another discussion later, another time. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Au revoir. Thank you, Valerie. Merci. Au revoir.